Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Truth Noir. Um, we uh, <coughs> kind of did our, our little impromptu one-year anniversary episode yesterday where we thanked everyone who's helped us out in the past and all of you for watching at home, so thanks again. And uh, here's the start of a, uh, we didn't really take a season break, we're just going to keep going because weird stuff keeps happening in the world. Uh, so uh, I'm joined here as uh, as per usual by none other than Mr. Dirk Beecham. How you doing, sir? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks oh. for having me on again. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, uh, you're uh, you just keep coming around and uh, I'm like the dog that won't go away. You fed me once and I won't go you away. You don't take no for an answer, and I appreciate that. No. So uh, now I wanted to ask you about this shirt that you're wearing. Uh, oh. Before yeah. we get started, I thought it was kind of phallic looking at first, and then you assured me that it was not. Well, it, it's a key, <clears throat> and um, I'm not sure why there's the key, but... Um, Maybe it's it, the key to justice. Yes, because this is a, a, a company, I don't know if it's... <clears throat> uh, anyway, it's, it started out as um, um, like the legal Zoom, uh, Chinese version of legal Zoom, where you could either download forms... And documents that you would need or you could either call or if you need to be maybe even go to an office to talk to a lawyer hmm. so yeah so, very yeah. interesting so and I knew that I knew the guy one of the founding fathers of that company oh really yeah I tutored his wife in English huh and so uh, very yeah. interesting very nice man mr. Eugene he actually starred in one of my short uh, comedy films oh really yeah uh, at my anti you can see it on YouTube, anti discrimination with Mr. Eugene. Hmm. And um, I have a goal to make several training. I only have one done, but I want to make several where every person of every ethnic group um, beats me up. So he beats me up in this one. I am in full support of that. Yes. I, I, well, I know that's what people like. Have people you want to hurt me? Have you had another white man beat you up on film? And if not, I yes, well, yes, I have, I have. That one is um, Sean Douglas visits the Dirk side, and uh, he was a famous martial artist. Hmm. So yes, and he was a white man. So he beat me up on camera, and now I have a Chinese man beating me up on camera. I have another script done, and it'll be where um, you don't actually see this black person beat me up, but it ends with with um, someone goes, "Oh, you've had a change of heart in helping out the orphanage." And then I'll turn and I'll, I'll have a, well, yes, I have. And then I'll turn as I turn into the camera, you just see a big black eye. See? Because earlier I was talking to the guy and, and I started off saying stupid things like, well, you know, you know how they all are. They're all on the dole, those kids, and we don't want to. And then he's, and I said, and then I'll look and I'll say, well, I'm done talking. He says, no, you're not done talking. Keep talking. And I keep saying more and more things that are more offensive. And, I, and I'll end with like, well, you're, you're one of the good ones. And then he goes, he looks, so at the, bad. he looks at the camera and he'll go, now you're done. And then the, and it'll fade to black. And then the next scene will be, I'm at the orphanage. And the woman who asked me at the beginning of the film saying, what changed your mind? You said you didn't want to help these kids. And I said, and, and I got my good face to the camera. I'll say, oh, I just had a change of heart. As I turn to the camera, and you see this big black guy. I think it'll be funny. Yeah, because people like seeing me get hurt. I don't know why that is. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, it's uh, even you kind of enjoy. I, it's uh, it's it is it hurt. is the one little bit of Schadenfreude that I do indulge in is uh, is a fantasy of me being injured. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, well, you're I mean, not different you're, though. You're, you're not, taking you're down kind of social issues in a kind of humorous way. <laughs> uh, I you know I suppose <laughs> I can get behind that. Yeah, well, I do care about people. So, but anyways, enough about you, Dirk. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we, uh, yeah, so we, we dug up some, uh, uh, one story that I, I just kind of thought was odd. Uh, yeah. But it also deals with one of my, like, very favorite places in the world that I have yet to travel to. Um, but uh, this one takes place in the Republic of Georgia. This was just last Sunday. Mm. Uh, now, a little bit of aside information about the Republic of Georgia. Uh, they are in kind of uh, this area that is between the Middle East and Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, it, kind of crossroads of the world for thousands mm. of years. And uh, they they sit between Turkey 
uh, to the east, Russia to the north, uh, Armenia and Iraq, Azerbaijan to the south. Mm. So this little tiny island of culture in the Caucasus Mountains, they uh, have a unique tuning system for their music in all of the world, and they have one of the most beautiful vocal traditions that wow. I've ever heard. Um, their their folk dancing is very unique. Also, the women wear very long dresses down almost to the floor, um, but they're they're so well trained that their their heads don't bob when they dance, mm. and so it looks like they're floating around the stage, and they wear these long dresses, and so you never see their feet move. Mm. And so it's it's just a, a fascinating culture and uh, one that I, I would love to go and experience in person. But this kind of odd thing happened recently uh, where there was a very odd sort of mm, not very violent terrorist attack there. Mm. And, uh, and I, I don't mean to make light of it, but like there's like really terrible things going on in the world in this one was just kind of odd. So what happened was there uh, is this uh, cafe, vegan cafe, I guess, that has recently yeah. opened in the Republic of Georgia called the Kiwi Cafe. Yeah. And it's a vegan establishment. And there was this, like, nationalist uh, sort of right-wing yeah. group that went in. Well, it's also... Um, it's in... Um uh, a part of town that's very conservative. One, two, um, it is uh, and, and um, an older part of town, and also a much more conservative part of town, and so it's become um, a hub for uh, not just people to have a good vegan meal, but a lot of people come and, and there's you know there's newspapers on the rack that are liberal or and or, or it, it, at the very least they're liberal politically, if not. Um, uh, things for LBGT, you know, the lesbian, gay. Right. That was another um, thing that was reported you was can, that before the actual incident of harassment occurred yeah. that uh, the, the members of this group, uh, they're called the Bergman Group, hmm. which uh, doesn't sound very Georgian to me, but uh, they had uh, reportedly come in before asking if the, that establishment had been frequented by any homosexuals or foreigners yeah uh, they're just kind of like very ultra nationalist uh, yeah. kind of group and so uh, uh, this last Sunday they came in wearing sausages around their neck and mm. throwing meat at the customers yeah, and, a, and it precipitated a brawl, which kind of spilled out onto the streets. And mm. apparently, there's been no arrests made yet. Oh boy, that's not good. But uh, that means the cops kind of like that. Yeah, you know? I guess they all ran off before anyone showed up or whatever. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, it's a very beautiful country. Or yeah, well, it's city. A, yeah, it's city. A, a mountain country. Uh, they also have this uh, this. Ultra Nom Noms. This is Kachapuri, which is uh, one of their national little bits of cuisine. It's kind of like a thick crust pizza with eggs and cheese and all kinds of other good stuff in it. Wow. Um, yeah, that'll stick to your bones. But uh, yeah, it's uh, just a really cool spot. I think, that, yeah, here we yeah, have here. a picture of the front of the kiwi cafe yeah. and, uh, and it's their their hub too it's where people go to talk or wherever you know um apparently you can have a beer outside yeah and that's awesome but uh yeah some people decided they wanted to go and cause a ruckus there and uh yeah now uh as always happens on the show uh our photos are mixed in with the other topic we wanted to uh discuss. So we'll try to so, skip through the other topic. Yeah, well oh, or yeah. we could just uh bring it up right now and we'll just kind of flip flop back and forth. Okay. But uh the other thing that we wanted to talk about is aside from go Republic of Georgia, don't let the Yeah. Don't let the carnivore Nazis bum you yeah. out too much. Because there's a lot of parts of Georgia that are already 
a liberal and open-minded, you know. And being so close to the Middle East, they have held on with pride to their liberalism and their open-mindedness, which was well, and, been, and uh, I think in general, and, just their culture in general. Yeah, um, so it's they, been um, they were one of the first uh, actually recorded Christian nations mm -hmm. in the world uh, very shortly after Armenia very shortly after the death of Jesus which was like a, yeah. you know, within a couple centuries um, and they get invaded by the Turks and Russia you know once or twice a century so uh, yeah. it's uh, it's always been a kind of contentious locale yeah for you know and it's amazing they're as free factions. as they are because Georgian uh, people are supposed to be friendly and Georgian women are not well, like say your Iraqi or Turkish women, they're, yeah, they're, they're much more open. Yeah, they're, and, they're in a very more small religious Western people. Way. They're religious, but, but they're, they're, they're they're not, to my knowledge, not super fanatical. No, and no, and they're about. very uh, affectionate and people, so, um, and they're not as closed. Uh, they also have an excellent uh, volunteer exchange English teaching program hmm. where it, it doesn't pay a whole lot. You make the same as an average teacher would, which I think at the time I looked into it was about $300 a month, which hmm. would be enough for you to live in the city and support yourself. Mm -hmm. But uh, what they offer is a cultural exchange where they will set you up with a host family hmm. and you go work at one of their schools for, I think it's like six hours, you know, 25, 30 hours a week. And then you get to live in Georgia the rest of the time and hang out and go see all of the ancient churches and super tall mountains and go skiing and whatever else. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, one of these days, guys were coming to visit. My apologies in advance. <laughs> yeah. I'm bringing Dirk with me. Yeah, I'd like to go. So, look, look out. Uh, but yeah, there was another sad thing that happened, uh, you know, within the last couple of days, and this is uh, this is uh, our dearly departed friend Harambe. Now, there's a lot of uh, argument back and forth as to now, yeah. of course, anyone who's possibly been living in a box, you know, this last week that hasn't heard about it. Uh, there was a. There's a zoo in Cincinnati where uh, Harambe here used to live. He was part of the uh, gorilla exhibit at the Cincinnati Zoo. A toddler, a small child, somehow found himself in the gorilla enclosure, uh, at which time Harambe here uh, approached the child uh, and had yeah. some interaction with it where he was pulling the child across the enclosure. The argument on one side is, is that he was taking a uh, protective posture, uh, and the other one, the other argument is that they, <coughs> that the gorilla would have hurt and killed yeah, the child they, they, possibly. Yeah, the, the, the and so guy they, from the zoo said, "Well, he flung the child through the water, and and then if he if he flung him one more time." But while he was standing closer to the cement wall, uh, the child would have died. Sure. But there was other arguments um, that you had brought up that, well, <clears throat> uh, that the gorilla was agitated, and while he had the kid cornered and he was protecting him, he felt that the humans were coming too close to him, so he kind of charged him, but was still holding the child. So he wasn't really flinging the child through the water. He was more of... Yeah, trying to charge the, the humans because gorillas do tend to charge to try to make people back off. Right. And um, so, and then he walked over casually to another wall to kind of isolate himself from people. And yeah, so, there's, a, there's actually a lot of video of it online, um, you and, know, and um, it speaks for itself. Uh, the end result was that this... Uh, and now there's a blame game. Well, yeah, yeah, so the end result was the gorilla was shot dead. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, and the child, of course. Uh, and he's on a very endangered species list. His, yeah, his species is on the way are, out. are not plentiful in the world. They're critically no. endangered. Critically um, endangered. Yeah, they are critically endangered. And so, yeah, and then, so then another uh, one was shot dead because, uh, you know, their parents couldn't be bothered to hold him back. 
That's one argument. Okay. Uh, and so, of course, the owner or the manager of the zoo, the owner of the zoo, is uh, coming out speaking in defense of yeah. the action that was taken. Um, and uh, of course, you have to do that because that's your business. You can't really accept any liability for, for yeah. something like that. Uh, so everyone's trying to blame someone else. I mean, obviously the parents are being blamed for not watching their kids enough by the zoo. And so that's um, a that's a that's one argument, right? That's the yeah. zoo. That's a that's caretaker a of animals yeah. that is saying, "Well, we had to do this." Uh, there is another argument, uh, and this was an email sent by noted anthropologist, primatologist uh, Jane Goodall. Yeah, yeah who has spent decades living with studying mm. primates uh, in their natural habitat, including silverback gorillas. And she wrote an email uh, as an open letter, it, it, like it's been published uh, to mm. the public and also sent to the, uh, the person from the zoo Mm -hmm. that has been speaking out in favor of what had yeah. happened uh, saying that any all of the behavior that she saw this animal exhibit was of a protective nature and that the dragging of the child through the water was a result of it reacting to the people screaming when they saw the child yeah, had yeah. entered the yeah. uh, enclosure uh, but that probably if that gorilla had planned on hurting the child, it would have done so immediately. Like yeah. if it saw it as a threat or if it was getting territorial yeah. and it was going to do yeah. something rash, it would have done it immediately. And the fact that it didn't and that this incident took place over a somewhat extended period of time. I mean, they had to call people in with guns to shoot it. Yeah. And that took a while. Um, you know, so this was not just a snap decision. This was something that was contemplated, and they were like, "Nope, we have to shoot the gorilla." And, yeah. Uh, and so I'm going to probably err on the side that the person who lived with the gorillas and has studied them way longer than the owner of the zoo has. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that her opinion of what she saw regarding mm -hmm. the gorilla's behavior was probably more accurate. Yeah, unfortunately, we'll ever know, never know, because uh, uh, you know, because they just shot it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's sad because you know he he, um, he used to walk among this earth. Well, his, his wild ancestors walked among this earth as gods, and then now he's already in a zoo. So, um, and then uh, now, of course, he's he's dead, and it's uh, I don't know, it's sad. Yeah, and uh, I don't know. I, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. The um, and also there's that thing about the uh, I read about how the kid get in got in. He said he crawled under a fence, and then he kind of climbed over, um, climbed down um, the, the moat, climbed up the other side of the moat, and then climbed into the enclosure, and. You know, it must not have been as good as the enclosures they have at the LA Zoo. The LA Zoo is pretty good. Yeah, I. Uh, and so I um. I don't know how he, he got in there so easily. It must be you know I would blame partly the zoo for that. I mean, how could especially a three year old? He was like a young kid, like three or four years old, and he just he scaled that stuff so easily. That's just they didn't build that thing right. Yeah, I just can't imagine it. Uh, otherwise, yeah, it, it yeah, it just I, I don't like it at all. Yeah. Anyway, um, the uh, like the other aspect of it is like, where were the uh, the parents, and why weren't they watching the kid? Watching their kid, you know. I mean, it seems like if you're someone's mother like mothers are generally pretty protective uh, yeah, of their kids yeah maybe uh maybe don't let your kid wander off from you for a long enough period of time to where it has a chance to crawl under a fence and up a moat 
I mean, yeah, and, that, and that kid traveled for a while and you to get into that. And you <laughs> to don't get know into where that. your kid is the entire time. Yeah, it didn't just go in. Like, it took that kid several minutes of traveling to get through all the barriers to get into a... Like, now, if, if the gorilla had killed the child, there would probably be talk of criminal negligence on mom's behalf. Yeah. On the yeah. part of the mother of this child. And everyone would have been asking the same question I'm asking now. Yeah. Except that didn't happen, and Junior made it out safe, and the gorilla got shot. And now there's a lot of people saying... Well, also, I don't understand, why know, couldn't they have tranquilized him? Well, the argument there is that the tranquilizer before it took effect would have agitated the gorilla even more it's not like an instantaneously acting oh. thing and that and, and and I agree with that like that might have uh, not been a, a good thing to do either um, you know well, yeah I, I, my, also my thing is this um, you know why couldn't somebody get a bead on his head for a headshot and then just wait and be quiet and see if they could uh you know the the the, the gorilla calm down and the minute he started to move then you you shoot on the you know have one guy constantly have a beat on his on his head and you know what i'm saying and just this let's right. let pr be a little prudent um because uh, you could always pull the trigger anytime you felt like it and that would be instantaneous right and so. there have been examples of this happening in the past. Oh, yeah. Where children have, uh, found, for whatever reason, found themselves in an enclosure. Uh, and the gorilla has returned the child to the mother. Or, yeah. Uh, or they know. just walk around and they don't, uh, you know. Yeah, sometimes they, 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 they will move the child around and then they leave it alone. They're not there to... Uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, and who's to say? I mean, there there are people that, uh, like, handlers that have worked in the zoo with gorillas saying that they've always acted with extreme caution around them and that uh, they believe that this action was justified. Yeah. Uh, and then you have fucking Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall yeah. said, no, that was not Are there any more pictures? Right. We yeah, we got a bunch of pictures. There we go. I don't know. I was at um, Second Islam. Well, there it is. They got the memorial for him. Rest in peace. How, how do you pronounce his name? Harambe. Harambe. And he was becoming an adult. He was 17 years old. Yeah. And they, um, they, they age um, only slightly faster than humans. And they, um, so in other words, he was probably like a, an 18 year old male human or 19. You know, a good young man. And uh, just like a lot of teenagers who don't get enough credit, and uh, <laughs> you know, and um, so this will go back one. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's a uh, he's a fine specimen, and he had his whole life ahead of him, and uh, probably good good breeding stock, you know. And they already had paired him up with two two gals. And, oh, how uh, they? Uh, yeah, he was living with two women, two female, uh, two female gorillas, gorillas. and um, well, we're going to need so to find I, another I get, Harambe. I, uh, I, I didn't get into a deal like that until I was in college, <laughs> and it cost me a couple hundred bucks, <laughs> and the whole thing lasted less than ninety minutes because then you know because they're clock watchers for sure. But this guy had a living deal, and didn't have to pay him. I mean, they liked being there, you know. It's a good point, Dirk. Yeah. I never looked at it that way before, yeah. which makes it doubly sad. Yeah. yeah. But uh, anyway, so that bums me out, dude. Let's look at more pictures of the Republic of Georgia. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. And so then, this is, uh, I believe this is a picture of the old city yeah, the old of, part. Uh, of Tbilisi. Because the they had to make a lot of forts back then because they were being invaded a lot. Yeah, like I, on, a, on a near continuous basis. Yeah, uh, and even recently, within like the last ten years, um, when the Olympic Games were in Sochi, Russia, uh, yeah, uh, there was all of the conflict going on between Russia and the Ukraine. 
slightly before that, uh, Russia had annexed, I think, an entire province of what was Georgian territory. Oh. And I'm not sure what exactly the status of that is these days. But, um, but yeah, I mean, just, just pretty scenery. Yeah, look at that. It's, uh, yes, it's, so it's, uh, in the middle of the Caucasus Mountains. And, uh, it's just one of those old crossroads of the world, you know? Yeah. That's not a very good picture. Oh, now look at that picture. Isn't that beautiful? Because, by the way, every old... Um, city in or old town in Russia that's more than you know a hundred or so years old uh, always is next to a river because that's you have to because back in the old days you couldn't pump water with electric pumps because you, you didn't have electric pump so right, you had to always yeah. be near your source of water well yeah and it was good uh, it was good defense also that was one part of the city you didn't need to build a wall around yeah um, but yeah I, I just, sorry, this maybe isn't great for the podcast, but uh, just beautiful oh, here we scenery. Go. There's um, this is, the, as you can see, this is the old town area or the old style area. Yeah, back and, at the and that's Kiwi the, Cafe. And that's the cafe, and that's why it was, um, uh, and it was it was unique for that neighborhood. And there's their, their signs. They're always having um, different uh advertisements on the wall and like I said it became a hub because yeah, this in that says, part of the town meets not green yeah they had they had um, in that part of the town there wasn't many places where people could go it wasn't like um, other parts of of uh, you know Europe where there's this uh, there's a cafe every so many blocks where people could get together and and uh, we're here you know by the way people hate to think about this especially the the, the neo-nazis that attacked him but you know there's gay people everywhere in equal numbers whether you're in a, in a town that says the gay people are, are, are cool or whether you're in a town that says gay people are horrible there's this number is still the same because people are just born gay yeah they're gonna and still be there so. so so um they this start filling a niche it wasn't just a vegan place uh it just started becoming a place well hey we can go there we can talk about ideas and we can meet with like-minded people and so um it just exploded as a hub and uh which made it a target because since unlike other areas of town which probably had dozens of places where either gay or transsexual people or just you know politically left-wing people could meet here this was the only place and which which made it more concentrated and easier to attack right um but uh it's it's a uh, I, I, I have faith in the Georgian people that eventually this place will be considered chic one day and cool. And there'll be other cafes trying to be like this. I and, think then it's one, cool. and then one day it'll become passe. And, uh, and, and the kids are, uh, of this generation will, will come and they'll go, oh, this used to be cool. Huh, that's nice, it. Pops. <laughs> and then they'll walk away and they'll go, because now there'll be, you can get any. Well, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. just kind of like the ebb and flow of Yeah, like people wouldn't go to hate Ashbury now. It's like, it's probably one, it's, now it's just a bourgeois neighborhood. Right. Where now there's other neighborhoods that are cool and cutting edge. Because that's how cool and cutting edge is. It's always moving to someplace new that you can't predict it. That's what makes it cool and cutting edge. Right. So, uh, but yeah, you know, yeah. There, uh, you know there's, there's a big problem with like factory farming and uh, no, sustainability. Yeah. There's another sign on the window that says "Animal Testing Breaks Hearts." Oh yeah, I so, um, uh, I actually studied you know. that in the early '90s um, about animal testing, and uh, <clears throat> right around in right around 1990, Western Europe, and simultaneously, almost at the same time, Australia um, passed laws that said you couldn't experiment on animals unless you were clear ahead of time in showing that your goals were to lower human suffering. And guess what? 90% uh, of all animal testing stopped. And to this day, they have a fraction of animal testing. America, ironically, 
the 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 um, misnomer about animal testing in America is that well of course it's for um, to stop human suffering but actually believe it or not it's not it's yeah, for many so. other reasons other than to stop human suffering and um, some of it's um, God they were working on one at UCLA and they're like, I haven't read recently a lot of stuff but this is just the stuff I was going through and reading in the early 90s they had stuff uh, at UCLA where they're finding a, a new way of that when you tortured a rat that if you injected him with a certain uh, chemical um, that the dopamine his body was naturally making to make the, the next series of torturings you did to him less painful you could you could lower that so so the second bit round of torturings you gave him were, were um, a lot worse Right. Yeah. yeah so you have so. a lot of weird things like that. You have a lot of animal testing where you get government write-offs. So you have, even though they know what hairspray does to rabbits and other animals, if you put excessive amounts on, they still do that, and then they call it research and development, and then they get a tax write-off. Um, right. And if they're screwing up this animal, which they don't need to, um, uh, a lot of them have weird ones. Like I remember there was one where. This woman, and this is one guy who was critical of it, joked, she was your typical nerd uh, scientist who had no social life. Um, she wanted to find out that when you, um, when cats get drunk, um, uh, uh, how, how does their social behavior change? And she so, but you have to like withhold food from them. Because animals don't like to drink alcohol, so they have to. So they would starve the cats, and then they would give them milk laced with bourbon. And um, and the, you know what they found out? And she spent a hundred. This is a nineteen early nineteen ninety money at UCLA. She spent a hundred thousand dollars to get and cats she, drunk. And to get cats drunk, and you know what she found out? Some cats, when they get drunk, get like to get sociable more uh -huh. and hang out with a buddy, and some like to get drunk and isolate. And then some fight. No shit. I could have told you that if I went to any local bar. Some people socialize more with a buddy. Some people fight. And some people like to isolate. Well, what the hell? You know, so... We, we, well, we, you know what it is, Dirk, is we of, just entered the wrong field, is what we yeah. did. We could have gotten paid $100,000 yeah. to get cats drunk. Well, also on my, my uh, on this one and we, guy, and we missed the ball. We can't be angry about it, right? Surely. I forgot the guy's name who was a big. He, I forgot the guy's <laughs> name who was a big champion of it. Uh, I had heard him on the radio speak, and I called him up, and he actually had an office in the early 1990s in Pasadena. He picked up the phone. I said, "Oh my God!" And his name was Javier. I forgot what his last name, Galante or something. And he told me all about the stuff, and then he sent me some stuff in the mail, and that's where I started reading about UCLA. And, um, and um, it was, uh, but one of the things also about animal testing is um, Europe started pulling ahead of us uh, starting in the late 80s and early 90s medically. And now they've, well, early on there, they start catching up with the technical equipment. But all through the 80s, they were pulling ahead of us because they were reducing animal experimentation and they were increasing what's called a clinical experimentation. I mean, you observe patients, human patients. So this weird thing where, um, uh, for example, we were wasting money having a woman observe cats get drunk, but when she should have been observing humans getting drunk. Um, they uh, talk about how they, uh, this absurdity, well, we still have it where we try to induce AIDS in a rat and then we want to cure AIDS when we could be looking at humans with AIDS. The, yeah, that already have AIDS. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we had this whole big monkey, pardon my fun, my thing was in the 90s, they were trying to induce AIDS in monkeys and then they were trying to cure it and it didn't work at all and it wasted all kinds of money when instead they should have just been putting that money on humans. Now the doctors who work on animal experimentation, um, it's very important for them to keep animal experimenting because they're quacks. In other words, they are also, I suspect, are doctors that would have difficulty working with patients. So um, it's Maybe. kind of, yeah. So um, this is, uh, you can just basically phone it in and still get your paycheck where you know, 
anyway, so that's fine. I don't think you hear a lot of doctors talking against it. Yeah, I, I, anyway, I don't know. So, I mean, yeah, we went off on a tangent there, but yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we, we didn't really prepare a whole lot, uh, but uh, yeah, going back to animal testing, I was reading a, a book about the history of the psyops programs in America and Russia. Okay. This was from the uh, probably the late 60s through and it lasted up until officially the early 90s hmm. in America. Um, but one thing that the Russians were doing was they would take a uh, so psyops is psychological warfare mm -hmm. and techniques of um, astral projection oh, yeah, for too. the purposes yeah. of surveillance. Yeah, uh, I guess the film, add to that uh, in a the film, uh, the men who stare at goats. Yeah, was based on that mm -hmm. a little bit. It portrayed actual people involved in those programs. Mm -hmm. And one thing that the uh, Russians were recorded as doing, I'm sure mm -hmm. there was something similarly terrible that we did, but uh, what they would do is they would isolate a, a mother rabbit mm -hmm. or a cat or something like that, and they would take its babies into another room mm -hmm. and torture them to death mm -hmm. to see if there was a brainwave response triggered by that by the mother rabbit who mm -hmm. couldn't see it but they wanted to test to see if it would mm -hmm. be somehow receptive, yeah. receptive of what was happening in the other room mm -hmm. and they found that like, their results were no negligible yeah or ambiguous yeah but yeah, uh, it's um, yeah, and, uh, you know, and it's like my, you could have uh, could have used that money for all kinds of oh stuff. yeah, oh yeah. That's why you need oversight committees and people to look in and say, hey, what are you doing this for? And like I said, the, when Australian government and Western European governments have said, hey, are you working like knock on the door? Are you working on something that's going to help lower human suffering? And you had a lot of doctors going, um, well, I. Um, uh, I'm sorry, but you're fired. You can go get another job, and maybe you can work at a gay cafe, handing out, you know, tofurkey, falafel, tofurkey and falafels, and uh, <laughs> maybe you might find your niche there. But um, um, I think your services are no longer needed. Oh, yeah, I did I tell you, I have a friend of mine. His name's um, he's my uh, one of my bosses. His name is Lance Mungia. He works at this other television studio. Brand X, and um, Brand X. Well, this we're the name brand, Tronebox.com, and then uh, that's what you're watching right now. Anyway, he uh, he works at this small public access channel in Monrovia, but he's working on a movie, and I think the title is, um, or it's about what's called remote viewing. It's what you were just talking about. Oh, sure, yeah. That's the title of it, uh, remote viewing, and uh, he actually went around and he interviewed um, the CIA agents that ex were because they experiment on humans too and so he he went around and found these people and he got interviews with them so he's going to put out a documentary uh within a year or so oh, awesome. about remote viewing and he's like hey maybe we should bring him on as a guest i would love to talk to him there we go yeah god i just thought of it right now i'm glad you brought this up and so he um he's big on that um um he believes in, in that stuff so, um, yeah, and he's a pretty articulate guy, too. I think you'd like him as a guest. No, anyway. No, it sounds good to me, man. Yeah. I, I, I'm always looking for we more We've got another show in there. We've got another show stuff. getting ready to be done. Yeah, because uh, that's what we need to do. And this is someone that's local to the area? Yeah, he lives in Monrovia. Okay, cool. Yeah, so. yeah, I've had a lot of people say, oh, I'd like to be on your show, or I've approached him about being on the show because I've seen stuff that they do that I think is cool. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I'm in New York, or I'm in yeah. Texas, or yeah. do you, can we do it via Skype, or, hmm. you know, whatever, and... By a satellite. So, yeah. yeah, any of those. And uh, so we're, we're still working on getting some kind of yeah, be good. video yeah. interview thing. But yeah, always interested in live in the studio guests. So Yeah. Uh, all right, you guys, I uh, think we pretty much talked this one out. Um, okay. All right, Harambe should still be alive. Yeah. Poor fella. Um, Fine young man. Uh, I'm not saying that... Uh, 
you know, mom of the child should be brought up on criminal charges, but uh, we we need to I, make I, sure it doesn't am, happen again. Yeah, I am going to say that uh, you know, bad parenting and not looking after your kids yeah. is in general not a good thing. You should be a good parent, and you should not let your kid climb into the gorilla enclosure. And also, if you're a zoo, you should not make it possible for a little kid to crawl into your animal enclosure because they could die. Yeah, I, I um, with my, even when I was a teenager, I don't know if I could have easily gotten into a enclosure in, at the L.A. Zoo. So Philadelphia Zoo must be pretty... Um, yeah, I think this was Cincinnati. Cincinnati, um, yeah. But you yeah, think you think any zoo in America though would have had some kind of standard like so many feet with an incline? Because I remember at the LA Zoo they were very proud when I was a small child talking about that there was an incline, and then there was this. So if an animal wanted to gallop, he started galloping down, and if he tried to jump, um, he would not. He would clear be at the an wall. angle. He could, yeah, because he's at a downward angle and he can't twist his back up enough to get leverage so um um so so then he would have to leap from here but what happens is is any animal that gets to the close will be tempted to put a couple hooves there so he can get a little closer because he's not he won't be quite close enough uh, to leap this far away so um it's like this so he he will always either go down he has a temptation to always want to go down and then once he goes down he can never make the leap properly so it's, it, it's like foolproof and it's measured so he could never want to leap from this far away because he's not close enough. So right. uh, it's, it, and they were very proud of it when I was a child. They oh, they were very proud that this that, that no gazelle or no big good jumpers because there's a lot of good jumpers out there in sure. nature, uh, cheetahs and everything. They all can clear a lot of footage. Mm-hmm. And um, so uh, so I, I I I guess Cincinnati didn't get the memo. Apparently not. So. Okay. So yeah, that's a travesty, um, and we hope that our our brothers in uh, and sisters, yeah, and our sisters and our our ones of dubious orientation, right, are <laughs> are doing fine and are going to be having a better life in. How do you pronounce that? Tib Tbilisi. Tbilisi. Oh, it's a beautiful name. And yeah, no, definitely want to go one of these days. Yeah. Because yeah, you guys. Uh, if if you're uh, listening to the podcast, obviously you're not seeing these hard rocking pictures, but uh, it is a beautiful countryside. Um, so, all right, well, yeah, if you want to eat the meat, eat the meat. If you don't want to eat the meat, don't eat the meat. If you don't like the people that don't eat the meat, go somewhere else than where the people that don't eat the meat are eating. Yeah. And don't be a prick. It's very right. simple. Very simple. Very simple. Um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, keep your fucking kids out of the gorilla enclosure. <laughs> fucking assholes. Yeah. Um, also, very simple. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so that's it. We're done. Uh, thanks once again to Dirk. All right. For being on the show. And uh, we will be back at you next week talking about more weird stuff. And in the meantime, we're going to get there safe. Take care. We'll catch you next time. Bye.